Genesis chapter 32. Hallelujah. My God. Hallelujah. Jesus. Come on, let's just worship him again. He called your my God, we give you glory. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus.
me that Esau was the one who was to inherit. He was the one that would have the birthright or the priesthood of the family. Amen. And as it was, uh, one day Esau was coming in from hunting and he was hungry and, and he was tired and and he, he, he just really, you know how you get sometimes. You've been out and you're all stressed out and, and things just haven't gone right for you and you're really starving for something. And, and so he began to come to his brother and he said, man, I'm just so hungry. He said, what is that you got cooking? It, it's just a pile of little beans. It's not a whole lot. He said, look, I want some of those beans. Could I have a few? And he said, yes, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll just give me the birthright. I want us to understand today that Esau was wrong. We often talk about Esau, amen, and how he was wrong. And the Bible said that after he had given up his blessing, after he had given up his birthright, he could no longer find it, though he sought it carefully with tears. It was too late, amen, for Esau. Once he gave that birthright away. Oh, but can I tell you, there was something more sinister going on in this situation. Amen. And that was the fact that Jacob was a supplanter. Amen. That was the fact that Jacob was a crook. That was the fact that Jacob, amen, was one who, who was a liar and a thief. Amen. And he came and he stole that birthright literally for a bowl of beans. Amen from his brother uh, just a little later on amen the time came when his dad began to become of age that was about to pass off the scene and he was blind in his eyes and so he called his son Esau and he said I want you to come in and let me bless you oh but before he could get in there amen Jacob's mom and Jacob concocted a plan and Jacob put on some sheepskin on his arm so he would feel hairy like his brother was and he walked in and he brought a bowl of, of the stew that his dad loved so well and he let him eat it and then he said okay let me bless you but come closer you don't sound like Esau you sound like Jacob and he said let me feel of you and so he ran his hands up those arms and he could feel that hair and something told him amen this is not really Jacob it is Esau and so he blessed him and gave him everything oh hallelujah can I tell you amen that Jacob left that room that day with the birthright and all the blessings of the family but he left that day as a liar as a thief as a supplanter amen everything in his life although it looked like it was going right was really going wrong it's just like us and we get the end in the world you know we're born into this world and everything is good we, we grew up through our childhood some of us have had rough childhoods some of us have had good easy going childhoods amen some of us were raised poor some of us was raised with a silver spoon in our mouth but all of us at one time or another had to come face to face with the facts I've got to make up my mind which way am I going in this world am I going to follow the trends of the world and I'm going to be led by the things of the world am I, oh come on hear me tonight there's only one or the other that you're going to serve the Bible tells me that no man will ever serve two masters. Amen. You've got to make up your mind whether you're going to live for God or whether you're going to serve the gods of this world. Oh, the gods of this world have a way with us of making everything look so rosy and making everything look so nice and making everything look so decent. Amen. When really they're selling us a bill of goods. And so we begin to follow we begin to attach ourselves to things of this world amen we begin to allow those spirits to speak into our life not even realizing that we are submitting to spirits of the world not realizing that we are 
submitting ourselves to demonic powers and forces. Oh, but we go through this world, amen, doing the best we can do with what we've got. And somewhere down the line, amen, we're thinking maybe we'll pick up God in the equation eventually. Can I tell somebody here tonight, amen, it doesn't make any difference when you plan it. It makes no difference how far in the future you plan on picking up God. I'm here to tell somebody tonight, amen, that you are being defined right now. Whew. You're being defined. We're, we're, we're all being defined. I, I wish I could go back and, and tell you a little about my life. I, I wasn't raised in a bad home. I was raised in a good home. Amen. But I understood, amen, what the Spirit of God was at an early age. I received the Holy Ghost at only 13 years old. Was called to the ministry at 16. Amen. 51 years plus I've served God so far out of my 64 years. But I want you to understand tonight, amen, that God in his integrity and in his, his knowledge of where I was at, amen, realized that I had come to a place in my life that I was making some irrational decisions. I was making some decisions that probably would already have me in an early grave. I was making some decisions, amen, that probably would not have worked out really well for me. Oh, I was going to be a commercial artist. I had it all planned out, and, and, and the doors opened up for me, amen, that as soon as I got out of high school, I could move to Houston. I could become the commercial artist I wanted to be. Oh, but God, in his infinite mercy, stepped in and said, not today. That's not a real good idea. I want to take you, and I never had been to youth camp before, but my mom asked me, she said, would you like to go to youth camp this year? And I thought, you know what, all my friends are going, so I guess I'll go, hallelujah. 13-year-old boy, at a big youth camp, I was a backwards kid, believe it or not. Hallelujah. I was very backwards. I'd say hi to a girl and turn five shades of red. But I was in this youth camp. And I was laying on my bed in the middle of the night. I could hear the clamor going on throughout the dorm. All the other boys getting up and pulling pranks on one another. But there was something on the inside of me that just wasn't letting me get up and participate. It just wasn't letting me, Brother West, follow the status quo that was going on at the time. There was something far deeper that was working on my inner being. There was something that was moving on my soul that was saying, hey, 13-year-old boy, you're making some radical decisions right now. This youth camp was set to be by God himself. You're, you're not here by happenstance. You're not here because all of a sudden you just decided you would go to youth camp this year. You're here because God has placed you here. And God began to speak to my heart. And the very next night, I went to an old-fashioned altar. And I fell on my face. And tears began to run down my cheeks. As I told God, I'll give you everything. I'll submit it all to you. God, I don't really need the smoking. I don't really need the alcohol. Two o'clock in the morning, laying on my back in an old tabernacle. Holy Ghost came over me. I began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Hallelujah. There were some deans and matrons that had stayed there with me. And they all began to cry. And they began to rejoice. Amen. Oh, I can tell you today, amen, that I have been divine now. Hallelujah. But can I tell you, God said you were about to have a past that you would not have liked. I, I, I'm glad that God saw where I was headed and he put me in a stop. Amen so that I could go with him and go his direction and leave that other world behind. 
Some of you here have this different stories. I know that some are here. You mean you had your time in the military, baby? You had your time in the bar rooms. You've had your time in, in places, houses of ill repute. You've had your, your time in places where, where there were drugs flowing around you and parties. But can I tell you tonight, amen, you don't need to let your past define you. You see, Jacob's name meant liar. Jacob's name meant cheat. Jacob's name meant supplanter. And Jacob's main name meant usurper. But can I tell you, God said, as Jacob lay there before God that night, you see, he had been running from his brother Esau ever since that had happened. And now he's coming to meet Esau, and he's scared to death. Esau has 400 men, and is coming towards him and his family and his entourage of folks. So he divides them into two groups, and he tells his wives, just in case something happens, and one side of us gets killed, I'll still have some of y'all. He divides them into two groups and sends them ahead with gifts. If you see Esau, you give him these gifts. Let him know everything's going to be all right. I, I, I want to I wanna make things right. I, I don't care how bad and how shady my past has been. I, I'm providing some offerings. I'm providing some things to my brother. I want him to know I want to make it all right. I, I want to even the playing field now. I want to level the ground here. He sends his last group, his family, over the creek, a little brook, whatever it was. And he stays behind and he falls asleep. And then he's awakened by the presence of an angel. Amen. The Bible said it was the Lord of hosts. Amen. You know what? I really believe that night that Jacob had a wrestling match with God. Can I tell you that on a concrete floor in an old tabernacle, and that was the first year they had them concrete. They had been sawdust the year before. But on that concrete floor, I wrestled, amen, with God. I was, you know what Jacob began to do? Amen. He began to wrestle with that thing. And, and he, he said, let me go. It's about to come daylight, he said, hey, look, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Amen. Somebody in the presence here tonight, amen, you need to get a hold of God, and you don't need to let God go until he blesses you with the Holy Ghost. And so, Jacob is wrestling with this angel of the Lord. And the Bible tells me that that angel injures him. But he still won't let go. He throws his thigh out of joint. I've never had a hip out of joint before. Hey Amen. I've seen some folks win it before, and I know it hurts. I was working a camp one time, and a little girl was jumping on one of them bouncing houses and threw her hip out of joint, and I know that hurt. I can tell by the look on her face. And here Jacob is, his hip's out of joint. But you know what? He keeps on wrestling because he's got his mind made up. I'm not going to let my past define who I am now. From this point forward, everything is going to be different. From this point forward, I'm going to be a changed person. Oh, hear me tonight. And God honored that. And he said, what's your name? He said, Jacob. What God was doing was getting him to give a confession, literally, of who he was. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a usurper. Oh, hallelujah. And God said, not anymore, you're not. I'm changing your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so God changed his name. And no longer 
was he Jacob? But now he was Israel. Just as boys used to say, Uncle, when they've lost their bat. We, we used to wrestle, me and my cousin. They'd pin him down and hold him. Say, Uncle! I ain't saying, Uncle. <laughs> say, Uncle! No, I ain't saying, Uncle. He'd lay across the top of you. <laughs> they lay right over you! <laughs> Say uncle! No, I ain't saying uncle. Push him off. They're back on you again. Say uncle! And finally, oh, had enough. Had enough. So Jacob finally realized that he had lost the fight. And he said, Jacob, God said, okay, so you're a truth planner. You're a liar. You're a cheat. You just admitted it to me. But let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to change your name. Hallelujah. From this point forward, your past is history. From this point forward, amen, all that doesn't mean anything. Because right now, you've come in contact with God. Can I tell you that when you come in contact with God and the Holy Ghost fills your heart, amen, everything changes. Your past no longer defines who you are. That's why I can call Sister Elizabeth, Sister Elizabeth. Amen. I don't have to call Sister Alcoholic. Oh, She's been set free. Her past don't define her anymore. She's a new creature. Hallelujah. She's been remade. She's no longer the same. She's been brought with a prize. Satan wants us to stay in that position. I preached this morning about heaven. Talked a little bit about how beautiful heaven is. But at the end of it, I reminded everyone here, amen, that heaven's not all that's waiting for you. Amen. There's another place called hell that's also waiting. You're going to be defined by your life down here as to whether you go to one or whether you go to the other. Only God and you make that decision. Actually, God gives you the decision. You make it. He backs it up. Hallelujah. God doesn't want you to go to hell. God doesn't want you to be in eternity in an everlasting fire. He's like, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Woo. Yeah, where I am, there you may be also. Woo. But you see, something happened. Amen. On the floor of that old tabernacle that night. Amen. As I began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave utterance, the Spirit of God filled us. Oh boy, all those desires I had were now gone. I didn't want to be that anymore. Amen. I was not going to let that, and I never have let my past define who I am. So God says, Jacob, what's your name? That's who you were. But now your name is Israel. Woo. You know what the word Israel means? Power with God. Whew. Hallelujah. So no longer am I defined by who I used to be. But now I've got power with God. Now I can simply call on his name and I can feel his power. Come on, you sat here tonight and you felt the authority and you felt the power of the Holy Ghost in this house. And God is telling somebody, I don't want to define your life by what you used to be or what you've been up to this point. Let this be the place where I change your name. Let this be the time.
time. Hallelujah. Remember Abram? Anybody remember Abram? Uh-huh. Now Abram came from Ur of the Chaldees. And according to history, Abram's family were idol worshippers. But Abram had begun to seek the one true God. I have myself been coaching here. I'm sure that you have prayed this prayer, God. If you're real, then you reveal yourself to me. You let me know how real you really are. And God will do it. I said, God will do it. And so what happens is, Amen. In a service like tonight, all of a sudden God shows up. And when God shows up, there's something on the inside of you that says, I've never felt what I'm feeling here tonight. I don't know what this is, but I've never felt it in any church I've ever been to. I can tell you what it is. It's the Spirit of God, and He's moving on you. And He's saying, let this be the last night of your issue of the past. Let it all change right now. So Abram came from a bunch of idol worshipers. He had already been talking to God. He had already been saying, God, if you're really real, if you're the God you want us to serve, then you reveal yourself to me. You let us, let us know. And God began to speak to him and led him out of early Chaldees. And he went where God told him to go. And he kind of wandered aimlessly for a little while. But he was following God. I think sometimes God leads us into places we don't understand to get us in line with his spirit. You see, what's, what's happened to Abram? He's being led around. He's going to all these different places. But God has got a plan. Amen. You're fixing to come back. And you're coming to a place that I'm going to show you. Hallelujah. Come on. That's what he told him when he left Ur of the counties. He said, go to a place that I will show you. He sojourned. He moved here a little while. He moved there a little while. He moved there a little while. He moved there a little while. Then he ended up where God wanted him. Hallelujah. And so... As God began to talk to him, God was revealed himself more and more to Abram. God showed him. He said, let me, he said, come here, Abram. And Abram had his, his nephew Lot with him. And he said, let's, y'all pick. Because there was a quarrel in, in Lot's and, and Abram's uh, uh, sheep herders. And so he said, look, uh, why don't you let, Abram, let Lot pick what he wants and I'll give you the rest of it. Hallelujah. And so Lot picked the well-watered plains. Uh, amen. A little place we call Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh -huh. He picked the bread stuff. <laughs> amen. He, he, he went, to, he wanted to get up close to the cities. But, but Abram, uh, standing on the mountain as, as Lot goes down uh, into that valley with his family headed towards Sodom. Uh, Abram standing up on this mountain uh, and God said, I want you to look, look north, look south, look east, and look west. How far can you see, Abram? Well, I can see a long ways from here. Everything you can see is going to belong to you and to your kinfolk. And then he promised him, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And Abram reminds God, I don't have any kids. What are you talking about? I ain't got no kids. Abram wasn't that over this time. He's probably around 60, 70, maybe. 75. But all of a sudden, God said, Abram said, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. You just told me you're going to give me all this land. Give me a sign. Okay. Now, I'm not sure you want to ask God for a sign every time. And you can drop it right on top of your head. You can drop it in your lap. Amen. But God will give you a sign, I promise you. And so, so here's April. And God said, go get a bullock and get a goat and get a ram and get some turtle doves 
and listen to me. I'm giving you directions. You follow my directions. Now, they had, they had a custom back then, and, and the men had to be equals. It, it was, if it was a, a covenant between two kings, or between two priests, or, or between two lawyers, or, or between two doctors, they all had to be equal on both sides. And God is telling him, I want to do the same thing with you as I let them do. And so they cut the bullock in half. They cut the, the goat in half. They cut the ram in half and, and laid the parts out. Now, according to custom, when there was a covenant between two people, amen, they would walk between those cut halves. They would walk between them. And at the end of it, they would come, they would shake hands, and the covenant would be made. And there was one more thing they would do, amen, they would change to their name. Uh-huh. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on somewhere. I feel the Holy Ghost. But God and Abram were not equals. And so Abram has followed God's directions. He's got everything laid out. And in darkness, the Bible said a great darkness came. And there was a fear that came over Abram. And then he was scared. He didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden, we hear God as darkness come across the land and night fell. Abram's sitting there. He's been chasing birds and, and, and animals away from the carcasses all day long. And he's still there, but God hadn't showed up. And after dark, all of a sudden, the Bible said that there came a light or a lamp that went through those carcasses. Ooh, hallelujah. It, it began to move between those carcasses. And you know what this was? This was God in the first time saying, I'm making a covenant with you, Abraham. I'm making a covenant with you. It was called the covenant of cutting. Oh, but a few chapters later, we see God making another covenant with Abraham. I want all your male children to be circumcised as a covenant. It's a literal outside sign of the covenant covenant between me and you and all your descendants from this point forward. Oh, but can I tell somebody here tonight, amen, then all of a sudden something happened. Amen. God shows up in the camp with Abraham or Abram and Sarai and he said, Abram, no longer will your name be Abram, but now I'm changing. Oh, come on. We've got a covenant going here. I'm changing your name. You're not going to be Abram anymore. You're going to be Abraham. You see, Abram just meant exalted father. But Abraham meant the father of many nations. And Sarah, the complainer, the dower, her name, Sarai, meant princess of the family. I'm sure that was daddy's little girl when he named her that. But God said, no longer is it going to be Sarai. Now it's going to be Sarah. Hallelujah. You see, he added that H. He dropped that I and added that H. It's no longer. Oh, come on. He changed her name completely. He just added to Abram's name. It's now Abraham. Hallelujah. He dropped the H in the middle on hers. He dropped the I and put the H there. Now it's Sarah. Amen. Meaning a mother of many names. Now, you have an understanding of the Hebrew, but I don't have a great understanding of it. But what I understand is that H that was dropped in is used as a symbol for God. 
So now your name's not going to be Abram. It's going to be Abram plus God. Hallelujah. Your name no longer is going to be Sarai. Now it's going to be Sarai plus God. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but from that point forward, God's name was no longer just God. Now he was called the God of Abraham. Woo. Wow. Do you understand the ramifications of this tonight? Can I tell somebody here that God said it's time to get tired of where you're at? It, oh, come on, it's tired. It's time to get tired of where you're at. It's time to make where you're at your past. It's time to make a covenant with God. It's time to build, be there with the Holy Ghost. I said a while ago, when you receive the Holy Ghost, Bible says you're a new creature. All things are passed away. Woo. My past is now my past. Whew. Hallelujah. My past no longer defines me. I told this story I think here before. Probably so. But I won't tell it again. I like it. Years ago, back in the 70s, Amen. My dad was a, was a man of God, and we traveled a lot and preached all over everywhere. And, and one of the pastors told us this story of a friend of his that happened to his church. And, and he was up in Chicago area, and he's pastoring this church. And, and one night the Lord had woke him up, and he had drove to the church and prayed for a while. And early in the morning, it's like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, he gets in his car, and he's headed back home. And he's going down this street, and God speaks directly to him and says, I want you to turn in that alley up there. And this preacher said, no, no, no. God, this is Chicago. You don't turn down dark alleys in the middle of the night. You ever argue with God? You ever argue with God? I am. I made some U-turns too. And so, the closer he got to the alley, the Lord impressed him again. Turn down that alley. No, God. You, you, you know this is Chicago. It's crazy to turn down a dark alley in the middle of the night here. You don't know who's waiting down in there. They may have a gun. And so he passed the alley by. And then he began to get his spanking. He got down about a block. And he said, okay, God, okay. He's crying. Tears running down his face. Okay, God, I'm turning around. I'm going. I'm going. He turns around. And he goes back. And he pulls down that dark alley. And as he pulls between those buildings, it opened up into a parking lot in the back. And he pulls in that parking lot. And there's a car parked there with a person in it, in the driver's seat. And so he gets out. And he walks over to that window. And he taps on it. And when he does, the guy has a Gun. Hello, I told you God he'd have a gun. You know, that's where we work. The guy cracked the window a little bit, said, Who are you? What do you want? He said, I need to talk to you. I don't know who you are, but I was at my church praying. I'm a pastor here. I was at my church praying. And God told me to come down this alley. He said, get him. The pastor walked around to the other side, and as he's opening the door, the guy's shoving the pistol up in the glove compartment. And the pastor says, sir, I can't understand why I'm here. All I know is God told me to go to my church and pray in the middle of the night. And on the way home, God told me, turn down this alley. Tears are running down this man's face. As he looks at this pastor and he says, you see that gun I had in my hand? He said, yes, sir. He said, I've been the executive of such and such a corporation here in town for many years. I was right underneath the CEO, next in line to the CEO. He said, we have a huge home in the suburbs. I've got the best of everything. This is the nicest car you can buy on the road today. And he said, you know what? 
He said, here I am. I'm sitting in here with a gun, fixing to put it to my head and blow my brains out and finish my life. He said, because everything has fell apart. He said, I've been an alcoholic for years. I started out just simple, just having a few little after work drinks. And then it began to possess my life. So much so that I was sneaking it in work. He said, just yesterday, my wife told me to pack my bags up and get out. He said, I get to my job today. And my boss at the end of the day said, here's your pink slip. You're over. You're done. We're through with you. You see, his life was about to be defined. If he would have pulled the trigger, that would have been it. But God, in his infinite mercy, sent an old preacher by there. You better ignore the people that tell you to ignore the preacher. Because many times God has told the preacher to tell you something. And that old preacher began to sit there and talk to that man and tell him about the Holy Ghost and what he could do in his life. He began to talk to him about repentance and asking God's forgiveness for his sin and walking away from him, walking away from the alcohol, walking away from the cigarettes, walking away from the things that divide his life. <laughs> He walked away. He said, I want this Holy Ghost you're talking about. And so he, he turned around and followed him back to the church. And the preacher prayed him through to the Holy Ghost. Right there that night, he walked into the house. They went, he said, Lord, your house. He said, my wife doesn't want me back. He said, I think that's about to change. He took him back to the house. And she opened the door and she said, what are you doing here? And the preacher stepped up and said, let me tell you what he's doing here. And he told, him, told her about the night's events. And she said, you're definitely different. There's something about you that I can see is different. And so she fell on her knees right there the Holy Ghost. You see, Satan wants your past to be defined as what it's been being. But God wants to change your name. The Bible said you'll become a new creature. Old things are passed away. God told John in Revelation 2 and 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, hallelujah, which no man knoweth, saving he, saving he that receiveth it. Hey, God wants to give you a new name, that there's not a devil in hell will know. Oh, come on, he wants to change you completely. He wants to turn your world around and turn your life upside down. Are you going to sit and let your past define who you are? You know, many times I've been to funerals. I've preached so many funerals since I've been a minister over the years. Most of the funerals a lot of them are sad because I know that person they lived their life the same all the way through up till that last breath 
And then they might have tried to repent, but because it was too late, they couldn't get anywhere with God. God had said many years before, you're letting your past define you. I want to change you. But they rejected him over and over and over again as he came to them. And let, let me just change you. Let me give you a new name. God, let me turn your life around now. I'm happy the way I'm living. The hardest funerals I've ever preached are those of people who live the way they want to live. Who follow their own route. Who didn't include God in their plans. Oh yeah. I've had them that can even talk the talk. They talk about God when I was around. But when I wasn't around, people would tell me, man, they cuss like a sailor. They, they, don't, they don't believe in God. They don't believe in nothing. But then there's those, like old brother Luce. <laughs> 80 something years old, I think probably 82 or 83. He was coming to our little church in Wells, Texas. And Brother Luce was uh, an elderly man. He had lived all of his life in sin. He had always been the same. His past was defining him. He was getting close to the end. And one night, he made a move and he came to the altar and he prayed. Did he get the Holy Ghost? No, he didn't. Not that night, he didn't. Oh, but could I tell you, just a few weeks later, I opened, I was standing in the pulpit on a Sunday morning, fixing to start service, and here come Brother Luce in the, down the aisle, and he was literally dancing, hallelujah, he walked up front, and he sat on his front pew as usual, but he didn't sit down, he stayed up, and he worshipped, and he danced around, the whole time service was going on, it didn't matter who was singing, it didn't matter who was preaching, he was dancing, and every service after that was the same, I asked him that day at the church, I said, what happened to you? I already knew what happened. <laughs> I didn't want to hear him say it. <laughs> he said, I was walking this in the school. He said, I've been praying. Tears were running down his face. He said, I've been praying for the Holy Ghost for the last several days at the house. He said, I'm on my way to Sunday school this morning. And I'm just asking God, God, when are you going to give me the Holy Ghost? And he said, the next thing I know, I'm speaking in tongues. And I can feel the power of God. And he said, I just kind of danced right there beside the highway. Whew. I preached that funeral a few years later. Actually, it wasn't a few years. I mean, maybe a year later. And you know what I titled it? Count it all joy. Whew, hallelujah. Oh, count it all joy. Because you see, all that past was erased. All that past no longer defined him. Hey, he had been given a white stone. He had been given a new name. Hallelujah. Can we stand tonight? Are you going to let your past define you? Are you going to let who you are now define who you're going to be? you got to understand, according to the Word of God, one day we're all going to stand before God. And the Bible said we're going to give an account for every deed in this life. Every one of us is going to stand before God. I heard one singer say it this way. He said he was standing there at the white throne judgment. And he, in his imagination in this song, he said, there was this big screen behind him. And on this screen were flashing scenes from his life. In the song, he said, no, 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 don't show that one. That's embarrassing. I, I was in high school. I didn't know no better. I was stupid. And all through his life, he, he's, he's, he's seeing all the stuff 
And the more stuff that begins to show, the darker the screen begins to get. Until finally there's nothing left but just a black screen. And then all of a sudden, right in the middle of the black screen, one red dot hits. And as that red dot hits, that screen begins to turn white all the way out to the outside. Uh, you know what happened? God just redefined him. Uh, his past no longer defined him any longer. But now he's defined by a different thing. He's defined by the Spirit of God. Every one of us in this house have been to the place you are. Maybe not exactly the same circumstances, but we've been there. We've been through the tough times. We've been through rejection by friends, loved ones. Some have even been rejected by spouses. But you understand one thing. That doesn't define who we are now. Because one day, that little red dot of blood
Why don't we just 
lift our hands and worship God right where we're at right now, my God. Thank you for your presence here tonight, God. Lord, thank you for speaking. God, we're asking you, Lord, let this go home with us tonight, God. Let this go home with us tonight, God. Lord, I'm asking you right now to dispatch angels to those that you're speaking to, God. Let the angels be in their home tonight and wake them on their bed. Remind them over and over and over how much you love them. And God, do it come to you. Come to the knowledge of who you are in the Holy Ghost. And hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, listen to the prayer and worship him right now. Uh, hallelujah. God, we thank you. God, we praise you, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, God. You just need to make up your mind. I don't want to be who I was. I don't want to be who I've been. I want God to change me. And God to rearrange me. Hallelujah. Put your past behind you and leave it there. Walk towards God. Make God the central focus of your life. And I promise you the blessing of God will flow over you. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget Tuesday night service, 7.30. Amen. And uh, the real announcements we need to make. There's the miracle everybody's been praying for. Yeah, he is. <laughs> okay, sister, you guys go. We've all been praying for us still. And Tuesday, we saw Dr. Surges, his radiation doctor. They looked down his throat and cancer is already starting to go down. Oh, and he is also to the point where he can swallow food. Oh, and, and I know this is a little crazy, but thank you, Jesus, for the maker of tamales. Yes. He is able to eat tamales and tamales like that right now. Yeah. So, yeah. God is working. I'm doing some of these things for right now. Yeah. So, yeah. Why would we just give God glory? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for what you did. We know it's you, Lord. We know it's you, God. Hallelujah. We give you glory in our praise in Jesus' name. When I, when I first went to the hospital to be with Bill and, and see him uh, as they were diagnosing him, what did I tell him? I said, God's got this. We went in for that first surgery. I said, God's got it. Don't worry about it. God's got this. Hallelujah. Yeah, it won't be long. You get that thing out of there. Amen. But he needs to model the house. Amen. Amen.